the uh, topic of music related to the Holocaust is one that seems to be getting bigger and bigger, um, especially since there are so many commemorative pieces being written now, and uh, also because as researchers begin to turn their attention to areas that they had not uh, looked at earlier in, um, in the Western transit camps, for instance, and in the camps in Italy and Greece. Uh, so I'm going to give you just a very, very brief overview of what happened in a few places. And in some cases it was unique, and in some cases it is typical of what happened in other, in other ghettos or camps. Uh, and we'll, I'm honored to be joined by uh, some people from London Voices, uh, some of whom I've worked with in the past, and it's always good to work with them again, and I thank Terry Edwards, their director, for organizing this for us. Um, and in be I'll, I'll set up what we're going to perform, and, and then we'll perform it, okay? And then at the end, there'll be some, uh, uh, there will be time for questions and answers. <clears throat> the first concentration camps were opened by the Nazis uh, in early February of 1933. This is a week after Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. And the early camps were not for Jews. A large number of Jews ended up in these camps, but they were not sent there at the time because they were Jews. They were sent there because they were communists or socialists or trade union organizers or other people that the Nazis just found to be unpleasant. And in these camps, uh, sometimes songs were written to you know, identify people uh, as being from that camp. And one should remember too that in these, before Kristallnacht in November of 1938, concentration camp prisoners could get out, they could have their freedom purchased by somebody on the outside. They simply had to uh, sign up over everything they owned to the German government and leave Germany. They could get out. And uh, the process of signing over everything they owned and make arra making arrangements to leave Germany took a little while. So these songs became known to people outside the camps. And in some cases, prisoners would be transferred to other camps and the songs would migrate. So the Buchenwald Lied, for instance, uh, was known in most of the concentration camps. And I know a lady in Los Angeles who was asked why she wanted to go back to Auschwitz to be part of a, of a film. Um, she said, well, I'm still here and Hitler isn't. And she spontaneously started singing the Buchenwald Lied. She didn't sing something written in Auschwitz. She sang the Buchenwald Lied, uh, which had migrated to Auschwitz. This song has a very, very interesting history. The uh, communist inmates at Buchenwald in the 30s uh, would spontaneously break into singing the Communist Internationale at roll call. And the camp commandant got sick of that, and so he had a song contest for inmates to write a song that uh, everybody could learn. And then when the communists started singing the Internationale, an order would be given, and everybody else would start singing the Buchenwald lead to drown them out. And they, they had these competing songs. Um, the text of the Buchenwald Lied is this. When the day awakes, before the sun smiles, the columns march to the day's toils into the breaking dawn. And the forest is black and the heavens red, and we carry in our bags a piece of bread, and in our hearts, in our hearts, the sorrows. O Buchenwald, I can never forget you because you are my fate. Whoever leaves you, remember they could get out, somebody paid for it. Whoever leaves you, he alone can measure how wonderful freedom is. 
O Buchenwald, we do not lament and wail whatever our fate might be, but we want to say yes to life, for someday the time will come when we are free. Now, this song, this text sort of walks a tightrope, doesn't it? Because this was going to be sung in front of everybody, and, and the commandant was going to pick the winner of the song contest, so they couldn't go too far afield, but it still expresses this hope for freedom. It was written by two men. Uh, Hermann Leopoldi was a very well-known Viennese cabaret uh, musician. He wrote the music. A man named Fritz Lerner Beda, uh, who had been Franz Lehauer's, uh, Lehauer's librettist, wrote the words. And so they get the song ready, and then they discover that they cannot enter the contest. Why? Anybody want to guess? They can't enter this contest because they are Jews. So the song was entered under the name of one of the camp guards, and it won. And then one cold February morning, everybody had to stand out in the, in the, on the parade ground and memorize the song. And from then on, when the communists would start singing the Buchenwald, or the Internationale, the other people would be ordered to sing the Buchenwald and would have this uh, football match. And that's how we're going to do the piece now. Please come up. Uh, you wouldn't know it to look at them, but half of these, peop these singers are communists. <laughs> and uh, so they will start. Oh, another thing. You know, there was no pitch pipe. There was no conductor. Somebody would just start singing, and then everybody else would join in. So that's what's going to happen now. The communists will start, and then uh, somebody will give the command to sing the Buchenwald Lied, and we're off to the races. Imagine that with four or five thousand men outside singing these two songs at the same time. Uh, we'll jump ahead uh, to the ghettos in the east. There was a rich musical heritage among Ashkenazic Jews, and um, they essentially had songs about everything, every activity of life. And um, in particular, in these camps, in, in the ghettos, uh, there were written songs that were resistance songs. We know most of them now as partisan songs. 
But there's a misconception about how they were used. In, in truth, some of them were written in partisan camps far removed from the Germans, way off in the east. But many of them were written in the large ghettos, Vilna or Kovno or uh, Wuj, for instance. Uh, because in these ghettos there were organized resistance movements and early on they were able to uh, escape at night and they actually had uh, meetings with partisan groups operating in the countryside. So one of the ways they found out what was going on. The Nazis never went into the ghettos. They were all fenced off and, and self-governed by a Jewish council of elders who they would organize police forces, things like this. In fact, in one, ta one ghetto, um, there was an elder who was really opposed to any kind of music making. He said, you shouldn't dance in a graveyard. And there were all these street musicians. And the Council of Elders said, OK, we'll outlaw the street musicians. But at the same time, they had a, a ghetto police force. And there was a band uh, made up of police officers that had to play for uh, official functions inside the ghetto. So the Council of Elders, after they've outlawed the street musicians, they then deputized all of them and put them in the police band. So they did what this Jewish elder wanted. They did away with the street musicians, but they didn't do away with music. And uh, these resistance groups had these songs that were uh, very strong anti-Nazi songs, full of hope. And incidentally, the Communist Internationale and the Buchenwald lead are both, they both have the same aim. They're talking about hope. I mean, from different angles. But they were all about hope. The song we're going to perform now is a very famous partisan, partisan song called Zognit Kein Mo. Never say you are walking the last road despite leaden skies obscuring blue days. The hour we have longed for will come. Our step will beat out like a drum. We are here. This is a sentiment expressed in 2009 by the lady I just told you about in Auschwitz when I asked why she wanted to go back. She said, because I'm still here. Hitler's not. So uh, we're going to do this song the way it would have been done at the end of one of the meetings. Uh, the, the resistance group meetings, and uh, we'll put this in the Woods ghetto, although this song was mostly better known in Vilna, but I want to place it in the Woods ghetto because the, uh, there was a young woman named Rachel Baum who was part of the resistance movement in Woods, and they had noticed that the cattle cars that took people away the same cars came back empty. It was the same railway, railway cars. So they devised the scheme by which when one of the resistance members had their number come up and they were shipped east, they would have a little piece of paper and a pencil with them and they would keep track of when the train stopped and what time it stopped. And by looking at through the slats in the walls of the train, they could see how large the train station was and what direction they were going, et cetera, et cetera. And they would send this information back by folding up the paper, hiding it between the floorboards. And when the empty car went back to Woods, the people cleaning it out would find the paper and then they knew what was going on. And then the case of Raquel Baum, she wrote back after she listed all this pertinent information. Then she said, we keep singing our songs. So here comes Zognit Kane Mole, and at the end of the meeting, somebody, probably with an instrument, would start playing it. And then somebody would start singing, and then gradually people would join in and create a new arrangement. It was probably different every time they sang it, because they might have a different instrument that night, or they, people, different people would start the song. So that's how we'll do it now. It's just as if this meeting is breaking up and the uh, pianist starts them off and they, they sing.
Now, I think that was really authentic because it, they sang it quite differently than they did this afternoon when we were rehearsing. It really was improvised uh, arrangement. Yiddish songs are common property in, in the Ashkenazic community. And um, even though they may per know perfectly well who wrote a, a song, it belongs to the, to the community. And the most famous Yiddish song is a lullaby called Raisins and Almonds, which was written about 1850 by a man named Abraham Goldfaden, who was a very famous composer of Yiddish musicals. And this song was known by everybody. So that during the Nazi period, the people were writing new songs, but that means they're writing new lyrics uh, that express something that's happening in their ghetto at the time, something terrible usually. And they, they write the lyrics so that it can be sung to Raisins and Almonds, because everybody knows that tune. And they, they picked other tunes too that were well known. So uh, from the Holocaust period, we have lots of songs that are supposed to be sung by the same melodies, right? Pre-existing melodies that everybody knew. And Raisins and Almonds was also done in its original form. It's a beautiful lullaby. Uh, go to sleep, my son. Your father has gone away on business, but he's coming back, and when he comes back, he will bring you raisins and almonds. It's a lullaby. In 1943, in Wuj, uh, Itzhak Spiegel, who was a lyricist, and David Begelman, who was a composer, wrote a parody of raisins and almonds with a brand new melody and a new text. This text is, uh, try to go to sleep, son. Your father is gone, probably not coming back, and there won't be any raisins or almonds. So Roz is going to sing both of these, one after another, raisins and almonds first with the piano and then unaccompanied no more raisins, no more almonds.
in the uh, death camps and the forced labor camps, there were two different kinds of music making, at least two different kinds. One was the official orchestras that were organized by the Nazis um, who played for public events. They, they, these were, were prisoners, but they had to play uh, in the morning when work details were being marched out of the camp, they played marches. And in the evening when the work details came back, they played marches. They played whenever the SS might want a concert of some kind for their own purposes. They had to be on the ready they, at all times in case uh, even one guard came into their barracks and wanted them to play something. Uh, they would play. And they also played on the platforms when trains were being unloaded. And in this case, they played uh, light operetta, mu uh, operetta music, music that would put people at ease. The popular cinematic idea that people got off the train while the, the orchestra was either playing or a recording was blaring away of the Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries or something like that, that's, that's false. The, the Nazis didn't use these orchestras in that manner. The, the, the purpose of these orchestras was to keep people marching in line, coming and going, and to put people at ease as they were getting off the trains. Um, the other kind of music making that took place in the, in the forced labor and death camps was secret in the barracks. And uh, the earliest example of that is even before uh, the Holocaust actually starts with Kristallnacht. This was in Dachau in 1938. Uh, Herbert Zipper and Jura Seufer wrote a song called The Dachau Week. These men in Dachau picked up scrap lumber, they bribed a guard to get wire, and they made their own small guitar-like instruments that didn't make very much noise and they had secret concerts in an unused latrine one night a week. And they had to just remember, you know, dig out of their memories this music that they were gonna play, besides the new song, The Dachau Leap, that Herbert Zipper uh, wrote. After the war, uh, Dr. Zipper became somewhat of, well, after Dachau, he had his, he had his, his uh, freedom purchased by his family and he and his wife went to the Philippines where he started the Manila Philharmonic Orchestra. He was conducting that orchestra uh, when the Japanese invaded the Philippines. And he kept uh, concerts going for a while with the Manila Philharmonic until the Japanese realized that he was actually working with the Philippine underground. And they arrested him and he spent the rest of the war in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. It's, always been amazing to me that they didn't execute him, but they did not. And after the war, he had quite a career internationally as a music educator. And uh, the Viennese decided he was one of their authentic heroes. And several times, he went back to Austria and they would have these big concerts where he would conduct an orchestra of anywhere from 14 to 20 guitars playing the Dachau lead. Uh, so the secret music making was a very viable part of life in the death camps and the forced labor camps. There's a song, a Yiddish song called Ten Brothers, Chain Ritter. And uh, this is a very well-known song. It's these 10 brothers who one by one die in a variety of industrial accidents. But in the version sung in Sachsenhausen, one by one they were led off to the gas. Now, whether or not inmates could get away with this kind of music making dealt entirely on, on uh, the mood that the guards were in or the attitude of the commandant. And in the case of St. Britter, uh, guards surprised men in the barracks practicing this. They even had choreography. 
they were practicing this with choreography, probably one singer at a time leaving the stage. And uh, they were sent immediately to Auschwitz. The guards didn't, didn't like this uh, song or didn't like the, them singing it. On the other hand, in the Gross Rosen camp, which was a satellite camp of Auschwitz, um, there, were, there was a request made at roll call one morning for boys who could sing. And uh, six boys volunteered. One of them was a man named David Kane, who survived and came to Los Angeles and became a very prominent uh, cantor and then rabbi. And he volunteered because to, not knowing what he was volunteering for, uh, in the hopes that he might get a little food out of it. And these boys were taken to the camp commandant who wanted to teach them a lot of his favorite songs. And they were, they were all um, drinking songs and bawdy songs, uh, some of them really dirty. And these boys, every morning, uh, before roll call, they had to be up and standing outside the window of the commandant's bedroom and would serenade him awake with these songs. And they did get a little extra food for it. So there's uh, in the barracks secretly in many camps, uh, people sing uh, Die Gedanken sind frei, which is a song that dates from the middle part of the 19th century, uh, 1848, the year of revolution in Europe. And this song was outlawed in many countries and was outlawed by the Nazis too um, because of the text, Die Gedanken sind frei, thoughts are free, who can suppress them? And people, you know, little groups of people would sing these songs in, in the barracks of, of camps. Um, at one point in Auschwitz Birkenau, there was so many people coming in that there wasn't a lot of singing going on. The, the, the women's orchestra at Birkenau uh, had, the, there were transport after transport after transport coming in from Hungary. And the, the orchestra had to play, they started during the day when the train started arriving, and they played throughout the night until they had to stop and go play marches for the work detail. They played through their entire repertoire three times to, as these people from Hungary were getting off being unloaded. And um, sometimes the survivors from these orchestra give, have given testimony to the fact that they would hear people singing when they got off the train, as they're going to the gas chambers, there were, uh, was one carload of French resistance fighters who sang the Marseillaise as they went in. Among the Jewish folks, it was very popular. Well, popular is not really the right word, but many people would sing uh, the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Or they would sing Ani Ma'ami. Do any of you know this? song? Anima Amin is the sixth article of the Jewish faith. There are 13 articles that were uh, formulated by Moses Maimonides in the Middle Ages. Anima Amin means um, I believe with, in, with perfect faith in the coming of Messiah. Yea, though he tarry, still he will come. And people chose to sing that going into the gas chamber. Late October 1944, just before all of the gas chambers were shut down uh, in Birkenau, there was a revolt staged at one of the gas chamber crematoria complexes. And um, the Jewish prisoners who were in charge of putting people into the gas chambers and taking out the bodies and all this, um, 
They were called Sonderkommando. They staged a revolt. They overpowered the Nazi guards. They took their weapons, and they actually made a jailbreak. They got out of the camp into the countryside, and it took a few days for the Nazis to track them all down. And, but they did, they got all of them, and they brought them back, and they were publicly executed in front of all of the assembled people in the camp. But when they were brought out for execution, they were in a truck standing in the back of a flatbed truck. They started singing on Mahameen, and spontaneously, the entire camp started singing it with them. Now we had four or 5,000 people in Buchenwald singing the Internationale and the Buchenwald Lied, but here we had many more thousand than that uh, singing all together anima amin as these men are taken to execution. At the time of the big Hungarian convoy, uh, in a town in Hungary, the Jews were rounded up and herded into their synagogue. And uh, they didn't know what was gonna happen next because they knew what often happened in the East, the Nazis' typical plan of operation, if the synagogue was built from wood, they would lock the Jews into the synagogue and then set fire to it. So all of these people are herded together into the, the ground floor of this synagogue, which in itself was a desecration because the women and children were supposed to be separate behind a screen or in the balcony. But they, the Nazis put everybody in together in the dark. And they didn't know what was going to happen. And the cantor who was among them started singing. One would think that he would have sung one of the Jewish prayers, right? No. He sang in diesen Heilgen Hallen from the magic flute, Mozart. In these sacred halls, there can be no hatred. So just imagine what it must have been like in that dark synagogue.
go to Theresienstadt, which is also known as Terezin. Terezin is the Czech name of the town. Uh, Theresienstadt is the German name, and it's the name that was used during the war for the, uh, the ghetto concentration camp that was established there in 1941. Uh, there's been more work done about music in, the, in this place than any other uh, place during the Holocaust because um, it was a town that the Nazis chose to uh, make a propaganda film. They wanted to show to the neutral countries that they were indeed simply relocating Jews to towns of their own. And in uh, November, early November of 1941, uh, they had evacuated 5,000 inhabitants of the town. And over a three week period, they brought in almost 40,000 Czech Jews. And uh, music started immediately. A man named Rafi, Raphael Schechter, who was a, a choral conductor in Prague and the choir master of the Czech National Opera, was in the first trainload of men sent there. And their job was to actually complete build, uh, the construction of a fence around the city and uh, to clean up unused barracks, military barracks for use by all of these extra people. And the first night these men were there, Schechter organized the choir and, and gave a little concert of Czech folk songs for everybody else. The, so this is end of November. The first documented concert took place in Theresienstadt on the 6th of December. And by Christmas, the Nazis knew these things were going on, and they decided to let it, let it happen because they wanted, to, if they're going to make a film, they need normal activities to be going on. But in the period of time between the 1st of December and Christmas, the inmates had done a lot on their own because there, there was nothing set up for music. And the men who were busy during the day building this fence had uh, left places in the fence open where they could get out at night and they would go forage for food in, uh, around in the farms. And one night they found a baby grand piano in a barn and it was missing three strings and one of the legs was broken off. Have any of you ever tried to move a piano like that? <laughs> okay. They carry this piano back into Terezin at night, and they carried it up five flights of stairs and propped it up with boxes and installed it in the attic of one of the military barracks so they could give concerts with it. So over the next three years until uh, October of November 1944, so from November 41 to November 44, Theresienstadt becomes a hotbed of musical and, uh, and artistic activity, too. And some of the major Czech composers were sent there. And this was also part of the plan of the Nazis because uh, in 1942 and 43, uh, when they start importing uh, prisoners or Jews from Western Europe, from Germany and the Netherlands and Denmark, places like that. The people that go to Theresienstadt are the musicians from all the Jews from the Concertgebouw Orchestra, all the Jews from the Royal Danish Philharmonic, um, they, Jews from the Berlin Philharmonic, they end up in Theresienstadt. All of the famous intellectuals in, from Western Europe, especially Germany, college professors, physicians, famous scientists, even two generals from World War I and their families were sent to Theresienstadt so that when the propaganda film was made, they could focus the camera on these people and people would recognize, you know, the people watching the film would recognize some of these people and say, oh, well, that's 
That's what happened to Professor Kleinman. I, I see he's okay. Everything's fine. This was the plan. Uh, Schechter was aided by a young man named Gideon Klein in organizing choirs, and uh, th there were nine choirs organized in Theresienstadt, and uh, Schechter and Klein made over 200 folk song arrangements for the children. Uh, Twelve, about 12 of these survived, and the reason the rest didn't was because they were never written down. Um, and sometime after Klein and Schechter were sent in, there was a man named Pavel Haas, who at the time was the best known of this, these composers in, in Czechoslovakia. He had been a pupil of Jana Czech, was a major figure in Moravian music at that time, uh, even though he was, he was on the young side of middle age. Schechter and Klein tried to get him to get with the program, and he was too depressed to do it because uh, in order to save his wife and uh, child, he divorced his wife before, he, when the, he knew that he was gonna be sent uh, to a camp, and so he divorced his wife, and this worked because his wife was a Russian immigrant. Her family had fled the Bolshevik Revolution. The city hall in their town had been destroyed in the revolution. They had to get new identity papers. And so the new papers they were issued did not indicate they were Jewish. So Haas knew this, so uh, his daughter told me that she remembered, even though she was just a toddler, but she remembered periodically the Gestapo coming, banging on her mother's front door and her mother would literally wave her immigration papers in their face and say, where does it say I'm a Jew? And she got away with it. But Haas, she died, Mrs. Hasova died in 1984 and her daughter still, and her family lives in Brno now. Uh, but Haas was so depressed that he couldn't work for a year. And eventually he did. And he wrote uh, what is considered to be the masterpiece of all the music written in any of the concentration camps. It is a song cycle called Four Songs on Chinese Texts. There was a volume of Chinese poetry in Czech translation that was very popular in Czechoslovakia at that time. And either Haas brought it with him into the camp or somebody had it. And he set four of these poems to music. They're all poems about homesickness. But you know, the, the people who had really given up, they didn't get homesick. They had just given up. And this uh, embracing the idea of wanting to go home is part of hope, isn't it? Uh, when they were performed, it, they, it caused such a stir that the whole recital over a period of the, the next weeks had to be repeated three more times because there was such a demand uh, for tickets to hear this, this. So we'll do one of them. We're gonna do the third one. Uh, Far is my home, O moon. This is a, not the best English translation, but you get the idea. The moon glows from black darkness of the sea in that far, in that far land. It is blossoming too. Love is lamenting its lost dream. It waits for a far off evening. The moon shines ever brighter through my tears. I put on night clothes. The hoarfrost chills so much. My hands are so empty, they say nothing. Oh, sleep, give me a dream. Give me a dream of going back home. 
sleep, you can't give me a dream. My yearning keeps me awake.
case of the shot that I'll talk about tonight is Victor Ullmann. <coughs> Ullmann was a composition student of Arnold Schoenberg and also of Alexander von Zemlinsky. I don't know if you, you may not know Zemlinsky. He was a very important uh, Austrian composer. In fact, he was one of Schoenberg's teachers and he was also Schoenberg's brother-in-law. So uh, Victor Ullmann got both, both sides of the family here. Uh, he was fairly well-to-do because his father, uh, even though he was Jewish, his father had been elevated to the Austrian nobility because of heroic, really heroic service in World War I and was uh, stationed uh, more or less out of harm's way in uh, part of Silesia that actually belonged to uh, Czechoslovakia at that time. So Ullmann uh, doesn't speak Czech, he speaks German, he doesn't know anything about being Jewish at all. He's totally secular as, as most of these people were. Um, and he is arrested and sent to Theresienstadt along with his family. There is a chance that he would have been arrested anyway, even if had he not been Jewish, because um, he was a follower of Rudolf Steiner, who was an Austrian philosopher and architect and started uh, the Waldorf schools, which are still uh, going around the world. Uh, very popular in the United States, as a matter of fact. Uh, Steiner was hated by Adolf Hitler. Uh, for one thing, he was a successful architect. And uh, his philosophy had to do with building up people and being very positive and all of this, which also didn't fall in line with National Socialism. So people who belong to the Anthroposophical Society uh, could also find themselves in concentration camps. So Ullmann had two strikes against him already, if I can use an American baseball term. He realized when he got in uh, Theresienstadt that most of the music making activities were aimed at uh, choral music and especially at music for children. There was a string orchestra but there wasn't any combination of the two. Even uh, the Raphael Schechter staged The Marriage of Figaro and Carmen and The Bartered Bride, but they always were done with piano, with Gideon Klein at the piano. Uh, they would eventually give 16 performances of the Verdi Requiem, but it was with piano. And, uh, Ullmann realized that all of these activities were aimed at music that everybody already knew and music for children. And so he got the Council of Elders to let him start what he called uh, the Studio for New Music. And he encouraged composers who were there to write music like the piece you just heard. And they had performers in Theresienstadt that could perform anything. I mean, the, these were the best people from, in Europe. They were all there together, crammed together. Uh, and I, when I say crammed, I already told you it's 40,000 people in the space designed for 5,000. But at one point, in late in 1943, when all of these transports are going to the death camps, the population of Theresienstadt swelled to over 100,000 people. So we don't have, you know, people are not, taken to the gas chambers or anything like that at Theresienstadt, but 36,000 people died from malnutrition and illness in Theresienstadt between 1941, November, and late October 1944. It's a lot of people. So Ullmann is, is writing this new music, uh, three piano sonatas, a string quartet, a lot of songs, an opera, called The Emperor of Atlantis, which is another evening all to itself. But he also knows that he has these choirs. So he, he makes arrangements of Yiddish and Hebrew folk songs. Well, except he didn't know any Yiddish, he didn't know any Hebrew, 
and he didn't know any Yiddish or Hebrew folk songs. So where does he get this music? And uh, the best guess is that he got it out of a book, a Zionist songbook called uh, Maccabi Liederbuch, published in Berlin in 1931. There was a copy in Theresienstadt. We don't know if some, one of the prisoners brought it or it may have already been in the town library. But his arrangements are in the same keys as the songs are in the songbook. And he uses the same German transliteration of the Hebrew and the Yiddish. So it's a good guess that they came from there. So we're gonna sing the two songs that he arranged for a mixed choir. And we'll do them as if they were one piece, one following right after the other. The first is Eliyahu Hanavi, uh, which is sung at the close of every Friday evening service. It's calling on the prophet Elijah to uh, come back and proclaim redemption, to proclaim the Messiah's coming. The second song is a Zionist song called Anu Olim Artsa. We are going up to the land with song. Now, in Israel today, they sing Anu Banu Artsa. We have come up to the land. So do these two without pause.
choir kept being taken away to Auschwitz. He kept, had to keep reforming the choir. He, he, so he actually did these 16 performances with four different choirs over the course of a year from uh, 1943 to October of 1944. And the uh, plan for the Nazi propaganda film was to film part of the performance of Elijah and use it uh, under the, the main credits. But the uh, plan didn't work out because first of all, the film was bad and secondly, the recording is really terrible. I had a colleague at the University of Tel Aviv who spent years trying to, to discover if anyone survived from that choir. And he decided that no one had because he couldn't find any survivors. And I was making a presentation like this uh, in 1995 in Minneapolis at the University of Minnesota. And I had the, the visual image of this bad photo that the Nazis had taken. And the man in the audience saw himself in the photo. And he and his brother, who were standing right next to each other, both survived. They were both cantors. They both ended up in the United States. Uh, Henry in Minneapolis and his brother in New York City. Uh, and this is what he says, what he wrote about this. After the performance of the creation, we started rehearsing for Mendelssohn's Elijah. We thought it to be very odd because all of his works were forbidden to be performed in any German controlled territory. Also, the contents of the text have passages that are possibly not too comfortable to a Nazi ear. It was time for the performance. The Nazi commander in his SS uniform cohort sat down. The Jewish leaders of the camp, strangely enough, were placed right next to them. We, the choir, took our position. The soloists appeared. The conductor raised his baton. Just try to imagine the anxiety of these performers as the huge choir of inmates cried out in a strong fortissimo. Do any of you know what the choir opens Elijah with? Help, Lord. Help, Lord. Wilt thou quite destroy us? So we're going to sing the final chorus of uh, Elijah, if you guys want to come up again. But uh, before we sing it, let them get situated. We'll play the Nazi recording from October 1944. Um, of the, the German choir. And just remember, as you're listening to these people, two of them survived. <laughs>